Hello, uh, this is for Astronomy 320, Sacramento City College, Summer 2020. Um, we're continuing on in Chapter 2. This was the last slide for the other video, the last video I, I uploaded two nights ago. And so, basically, the book, your book then starts going into um, the Ancient Greeks. So if we take a look, your book is going to be right here. And so here are the, oh, I just forgot. I'm uploading a video. We're not going to be able to do this, are we? Um, oh, it, it, that went pretty quick. So your book goes into early Greek and Roman cosmology, mostly the Greeks. The Greeks did a heck of a lot of work early on, and they made huge contributions to science. They had certain flaws. Um, but so anyway, this is what the book goes into. So I'm going to go into the Greeks right here. And so Greeks. And we may as well make this a slideshow. Many other cultures kept detailed records of the sky, such as the Chinese and the Mayans. So we're talking about completely different sides of the world. We're talking about South America, Latin America. We're talking about the, the Asian continent, um, Asia large databases but apparently not used to formulate theories of how the universe behaved so they would they would make observations they'd write down their observations but that was all it was just a huge huge stack of data the Greeks were the exception the Greeks looked to into using that data to try to come up with some explanation for the way the universe operated the Greeks rose to power gradually from about 800 BC, that'd be about 2,800 years ago, to about 500 BC, which would be 2,500 years ago. Okay, they were at the crossroads for travelers, merchants, armies from northern Africa, Asia, and Europe. So this is where the Greeks were. They're, they're at the center of everything, okay? They were sitting right there. You had all this stuff going on down here. You had the Middle East, where people were coming up with all sorts of Middle Eastern astronomers and did a lot of work. The Library of Alexandria was, was over in this area here, I believe. And so, then you got the Europeans up here. So it's like you traveling from one place to another. One of the most common places to cross through is Greece. So they could learn about all these other countries, all their ideas, all their beliefs, all their, you know, ideas about the way the universe worked. It all kind of got collected right here. Okay, so there's Greece. I can do Okay, so there's where Greece is. Now, ideas from different cultures from dis distant points on the earth could be absorbed. Generally traced the beginning of Greek science to Thales. He was followed by Plato and Aristotle. You can see the years they were alive. So remember, we're counting up because we're going from about 500 down to zero. Okay, so 348 and Aristotle was from 384 to 320. 322 and so on. Greeks relied more on thoughts and intuition and less on observation and experimentation. They just they didn't do experimentation at all. One example, Greeks believed that objects of greater mass would fall faster than objects of less mass. And then basically that's the way it was believed for that I mean think about that. Uh, 2000 years, uh, thousands and you know a couple thousand years that was the belief. Nobody ever went out and tried it. The Greeks said that's the way it was. The Greeks just made this into, this is where they wasn't observation because they didn't go out and observe anything. I don't think they just that was intuition. Their intuition told them that. Well, their intuition was wrong. Galileo said, "Is that really true? Maybe I should go out and try it." And he found out it was not true. It was not true. That's why Galileo is called the the father of modern science. So objects fall to the ground at the same rate if air resistance is negligible. This could be easily seen by dropping two rocks with different masses, or just go drop a, a bowling ball on a, or even not even something as heavy as a bowling a shot put in a baseball. Just drop a shot put in a baseball from some height, and they'll both hit the ground at the same time. The Greeks never did this. Not until Galileo did we know better. And then I already showed you this YouTube video about the astronaut on the moon. There is no atmosphere on the moon, so therefore no air resistance. So he drops a hammer, he drops a feather, and they both hit the ground at the same exact moment. So Greek contributions to modern science. 
Freak's first attempt to reach natural explanations about the construction of the heavens. So I think before that, people were saying Atlas was holding the Earth up. That's why the Earth didn't fall. Or was it was it um, somebody? Apollo was pulling the sun around the sky. That's why the sun moved in the sky. Something like that. They had they had these these gods doing the stuff to explain natural phenomena. Earlier Greeks satisfied with explanations such as oh, there it is, such as Apollo pulling the sun across the sky. They were free to think and debate different ideas about the clockwork clockwork of the universe. They believed it was important to challenge theories and question current beliefs, an important pillar to the success of science to this day. You don't just, uh, you know, take people things things on face value. You want to explore, look into it. You don't want to just take it, you know, what people tell you and say, okay, that must be the way it is. I'm not going to question it anymore, because a lot of times people are telling you a lot of BS. The Greeks developed an important branch of mathematics called geometry. Okay, so all the branches, you got algebra, that was the, uh, um, in the Middle East. I think the Arabs came up with algebra. The Greeks, geometry, of course, Isaac Newton, calculus. Geometry is considered with questions, is concerned with questions of shape, size, relative positions of figures, and the properties of science. You've heard of Pythagoras' Pythagoras' theorem. Pythagoras was Greek, so there's just Pythagoras' theorem, just an example. An explanation of the world would not be right if it disagreed with observed facts. One is to disregard or discard explanations that do not work. This is a crucial part of modern science. Okay, if, if you're coming up with some explanation, but the observation does not the observation contradicts that op contradicts that uh, explanation, then you got to toss the explanation out. They also were big into using models in science. Um, the Greeks, another contribution by the Greeks to modern science is the idea of a model to help understanding how the world around us works. Bohr model of an atom is an example of a model modeling the future course of a hurricane. The celestial sphere, we already talked about that a little bit. The Earth globe, the geocentric model of the universe, which is the one that uh, the world held to up until Copernicus. The heliocentric model of the universe. The geocentric model placed the Earth at the center of the universe. And the heliocentric model of the universe, the one we now go by, that placed the sun at the center. Well, originally I, I believe it placed the sun at the center of the universe. The sun is the center of the solar system. It's not even close to being the center of the universe. So you got your Bohr model of an atom, you got your nucleus, you got your protons, your neutrons, and your electrons orbiting around outside. Kind of like the solar system with the sun at the center and the planets orbiting around. Of course, this is just a model. Uh, quantum mechanics actually is what you need to, if you really want to get deep into how the atom works. Modeling the future path of a hurricane, and this is a video that if we were in class, I would click on this link and we'd watch the video, but we're not in class. I don't want to use up my YouTube time, but you can click on the video and watch it. Talked about the celestial sphere, that's taking the Earth is motionless and everything around the Earth rotates. We got the Sun going around the Earth. You can turn this little dial up here and make the Sun go around and so on. That's a model to try to understand the, the Earth, the solar system. Well, not the solar system, but that, take that back. But the universe, how the stars move, uh, summer solstice, winter solstice, and so on. Earth globe shows the dimensions of the Earth. There's the United States, Sacramento be around here. Go through Latin America, Belize, El Salvador, Nicaragua, go down here to South America. You got your Brazil, you got your Argentina, you got your Chile, and all those places. Okay, the Potomac, Potomac model of the universe. Greeks believed in heavenly perfection. All heavenly objects must move in perfect circles. That held us back for a while because we believed that the orbits of the planets were perfect circles. <coughs> But the planets, at times, appeared to be moving backwards in the sky. The idea of retrograde motion was introduced. I mean, that's not heavenly perfection. you got something that does a little loop-de-loop -loop in the middle of its orbit around the Earth. Like, uh, doesn't make sense. Planets moved around the Earth in small circles that turned around larger circles. Using complex mathematics, Ptolemy model was successful in predicting the future positions of the planets to a point, okay, to a point. But it, it's... It's having to make sure that you have big circles, cir little circles, little loop-to-loop -loop circles in the middle of big circles. Um, planetarium, we can't, 
I forgot about this. We can do this later. Um, platonic model Mars is seen from Earth. Um, hold on, hold on, hold on. It's gonna take too long to show this uh, on YouTube. I gotta, I gotta conserve time. But if you have Stellarium, this is distance between Mercury and the Earth. You want this number to be smaller. So you, if you go through, you see a bunch of different numbers here. Okay, because that this is just between Earth and, and and Mars. I mean, and Mars. I mean, and so as a result, uh, but ba basically, this is where they're about the closest. So what you'd have to do here is you have to go through like this to kind of see the motion. So you got to keep hitting it and make it go faster. See how the number here, this is the distance. Uh, so between Earth and Mars, that's Mars right there. And see, so that number just went up a little bit. So what you would have to do is you have to see, if I go, it, it's, it'll take too long. If I go faster than this, then boom, you can't see anything. So you have to go at this speed. So you can see that it's setting in the west and it's rising in the east. If you do it for enough time, you'll see that it looks like it's going one way and then it's going back the other way. But you got to do it for a couple of days. We have, we'd have to sit here and watch it like this for a little while. I don't want to use that much time on, uh, on this. So let me just show you. That's how you would do it if you wanted to do it. Actually, never mind. This is for the planetarium. Uh, the planetarium is the new planetarium they built at Sac State. I taught in it last fall. And you, you project the image. So that, it wasn't for Stellarium. I misread it. All right, moving on. This is what Ptolemy's model looked like. Earth is at the center. Now the moon and the sun are no problem. Why? Well, the moon orbits the earth in almost a circular fashion, and the earth orbits the sun. So those two look fine. It's the other ones, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, Saturn. Okay, those are the ones that look like they'd be going backwards in the sky at times. Okay, the background stars, they were, they were fine also. They only move because of Earth's spin on its axis. So they all move together. They're so far away, they look like they're orbiting the Earth. Okay, why do planets appear to move backwards in the sky? Um, keep in mind that, that Mercury only takes about a quarter of a year to go around the Sun once, to complete complete a, a orbit, about three Earth months to complete an orbit. So they're going faster than the Earth around the Sun. Okay, Earth is a one. I don't know why I don't have Earth in there. Okay, Earth is a one. So then 0 0.72, that's so that also goes around the sun faster. Mercury, uh, Mars takes about two Earth years to go around the sun. Jupiter takes 12 Earth years to go around the sun. Saturn takes about 30 Earth years to go around the sun. So they're going around the sun at different rates. They're all orbiting the sun, but they're going around the sun at different rates. Why do planets appear to move backwards in the sky? Mercury and Venus, both closer to the sun, lap the Earth as they orbit the sun. The Earth in turn laps Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Okay. Uranus and Neptune are left out of discussion because they didn't even know, the, the Greeks didn't even know they existed. Okay, so this is what's happening. Imagine you're on planet P. You are right here, okay? And you're looking towards planet T. Planet T is going around the sun much faster than you are, okay? So now you get to point two. Oops, you have to look backwards to see planet T. Now it looks like planet T is caught up with you again. Now you got to look forward to see planet P again, and now you're caught up to planet P. So it looks like planet P T went backwards in the sky, caught up to you, went forward in the sky, and now you're back to uh, being lined up again. So you kind of do this little cross right there. So it happens when one planet passes another. Now, that's a, uh, this is Earth. This could be Mercury or Venus. Now, this could be Earth here, and this could be uh, Jupiter or Saturn. So you're on Earth here, looking back this way, Jupiter, Saturn directly overhead. Now they're ahead of you a little bit. Now they they're back to being overhead again. Now they're behind you a little bit, and now you're all caught up again. So it's basically just perception. Okay, these are still moving around a circular orbit. So it basically, you can go down and see what's going on here. So this is a video you can watch. If we were in class, I'd show you the video, but uh, but it's on YouTube. And you can just click there and you can watch the video. It's one of the things we miss. We can watch the video together and I can comment about it or we can make comments about it. But I can't, it's just not going to work here. Okay, the Greeks argued for a stationary Earth. So I told you one of their arguments for a stationary Earth. If the Earth was in motion, we would feel a wind. Well, obviously we don't feel a, uh, we don't feel a wind all the time. They thought the atmosphere we existed in went out in infinite distance, okay? They thought everything was in the same atmosphere we were in. 
So obviously, they didn't realize the atmosphere moves with the Earth. So they thought that, hey, if we don't feel a wind, that means we're not moving in this stuff. That means everybody else is. Another argument they made was had to do with parallax. Like if you're riding in a car, you look out the window, you see the, the trees closer to you and the cre trees further away from you. Okay, the trees closer to you, their position mo changes relative to the trees farther away. Okay, so the same thing you'd think would happen with Earth looking at the stars. So here we start off with two stars that are all nice and lined up. If the Earth moved, boom, then you get to this later point here. Now you look back, and these stars are not lined up anymore. The one that was closer to you is over here. The one that was further away from you is over here. So because we don't observe that, that was an argument the Greeks made that the Earth is not in motion. Okay, So this, was, this is known as parallax. The, this, the Greeks said, if the Earth was in motion, we should see parallax. We should see this, the background stars and the, and the, and the closer stars moving relative to each other. Well, the thing the Greeks didn't understand is those stars are so, so far away that there is parallax. It's just so, so small. You need really high-tech uh, equipment that to, to even notice that that's going on. Something that was way beyond what the Greeks had available te technological-wise. Okay. I was going to figure out how to say this name before I did this. this these are brand new for us. These, these aren't old, old slides. I made these new. Eero to Thessines, he's a Greek, measures the circumference of the, of the Earth. So basically what happened is on a certain day, at a certain time, only once a year apparently, is this, was this absolutely true, that a well in this city called Serene, the, the sun hit it at 90 degrees. So in other words, you look at the bottom of the well, there would be the sun. And then basically right at the bottom of the well. So this, it was going in there at 90 degrees. That's the only way that you could observe that. So th at that time of the year, the light from the sun was striking the earth at 90 degrees. Now, if, if the earth was flat, like some people still insist, believe it or not, if the earth was flat, all the sunlight would be hitting the earth at 90 degrees, right? But in Alexandria, the sun was striking the earth at 83 degrees, okay? So you put a, a stick up, you see a shadow, you can, you can see, in other words, you put a stick up here, you see absolutely no shadow. You put a stick up here, well, you're going to see a shadow. Okay, so that tells you that the earth, that the, 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 the sunlight is striking the earth at an angle. Okay, and we're assuming the sunlight's coming in perpendicular, uh, parallel to each other. So as a result, not only was he able to show that the earth has to be round, but remember the Greeks came up with geometry, he was able to show simple geometry to get this angle here where these two lines would meet okay you could figure out where they would meet how far away you got that distance you got the angles and you was able to figure out where these would, would meet here and from that you could get the radius of the earth the diameter of the, of the earth and the radius and then from that you could get the circumference of the earth so basically that's how he was able to measure the circumference of the earth okay um, Hippocrus discovers precession. As the Earth rotates on its axis, it goes through a precession much like a, a slightly wobbly spinning top. This was discovered by Greek astronomer. I've heard that name now. If I look at it, I can't say it. Hipparchus, Hippocrus, by looking through observations. So, again, like I said, ancient, ancient astronomers, people look at the sky, they would note what they observed okay they wouldn't try to figure out anything from it but they would note what they observed so this Greek astronomer had access to that so by having access to it he was able to see what the sky looked like at night thousands of years before he, ex he lived okay and he, was, he realized that hey wait a second the earth kind of is wobbling on its axis so right now that's the North Pole of the earth this would be the axis that the earth spins on if it was extended out in space, it would point very, very close to Polaris. And it wasn't always like that, okay? So every 26,000 years, Earth's axis of rotation completes a cycle. So it will go around like this, and then 26,000 years from now, boom, Polaris will be the North Star again. But 12,000 year, from years from now, Vega will be the North Star. Okay, so it's in the year 14,000. It's about the year 2000 now. So in the year 14,000... 12,000 years from now, Vega will be the North Star. So this is something else the Greeks discovered that's pretty impressive. Concluding thoughts on the Greeks. 
believed in heavenly perfection, only orbits of perfect circles were acceptable, placed Earth at the center of the universe. Aristarchus was the exception, arguing that the Sun was the actual center. The Potomac, Potomac model was working well, predicting the location of planets, at least for the time being. Greek ideas gained great influence in the ancient world. The Greeks were adapted at both politics and war, and they had Alexander the Great. So even that, they were able to, because of their influence, because of all that, their, their ideas were able to go out into the world. So that's why Greek culture dominated until they were defeated by the Romans. Now we're up to modern science. So the first guy we run into when we talk about modern science, who's very, very famous, is a mathematician called Copernicus. Okay, Copernicus was born February 19, 1473 in Tehran, Poland, and died May 24, 1543 in Frombrook, Poland. Okay, I just thought of something. Hold on. Okay, well, I'm uploading the, a video from my lab, astronomy lab class, so as a result, this took five minutes to six minutes to load, believe it or not, something that usually takes a few seconds. i got to get a faster internet connection. All right, so this is what this is. Back around the 1999, A&E, back when they used to have a lot of, they, they took off some shows that are really good, but anyway, they used to have the the different shows. One of them was the 100 most influential people of the last 1,000 years. And so starting from the year 1,000 up to the year 2,000, who were the 100 most influential people? And they made this big list of people. Now you won't see the Greeks on here or anybody else who lived more than 1,000, actually now 1,000 to 20 years ago. But you can see the kind of names that are on here. Louis Armstrong, uh, Caruso, Chaplin, um, uh, Robert Oppenheimer atomic bomb so there's our first scientist maybe he's the only one uh, we got Ronald Reagan made it and a Niels Bohr there we go that we just talked about the Bohr the Bohr structure the atom Nelson Mandela and so you can see Joseph Stalin's on here so they, they didn't go for the good people they went for everybody Benjamin Franklin made it inventor writer statesman and then we can go up here and just see the different names uh, Marco Polo Madame Curie for um, radioactivity uh, Winston Churchill there, Mikhail Gorbachev, Bill Gates, and Ludwig von Beethoven. Now it's got an asterisk because the people who made this are interested in music. And so we can go up here, Bonaparte, James Watt, Abraham Lincoln's down at 23, Genghis Khan, man, they're really screwing the scientists, aren't they? Look at Adolf Hitler made it to made it to 16, and then Gandhi's at 17. Locke was a philosopher. They're really... There's no scientist. The scientists apparently, well, Lou, Lee Pasteur, so, so a kind of a biologist made it, a psycho psychiatrist made it, and then Leonardo da Vinci, he's science, and did uh, Mona Lisa. He, they put him on here for science, not art. Uh, that's weird. And then, oh, Galileo. Here we go. Astronomy perfected the telescope, confirmed Copernicus. And then there's Copernicus. And there's Albert Einstein. We got three in a row. Okay, now we got Karl Marx, a communist. They put a car communist guy ahead of these guys. So maybe they're, that's that's going to be it for the for the scientist part. Uh, so go up a little further. Uh, we got Charles Darwin. He's a scientist. He's the one of theory of evolution. Martin Luther. He was the guy who basically turned the Bible was Latin. He he, he uh, translated it into German. Isaac Newton, number two. The number two most influential people, person, people of the last 1,000 years. So this is the guy we're going to start studying here. We got Copernicus. We already saw his picture. We're going to have Galileo. We're going to have Kepler as well, but Kepler didn't make the list. And then Isaac Newton was was considered the second most influential person of the last 1,000 years. Gutenberg made it number one. Why did he make it number one? Well, afterwards their argument was that if it wasn't for the printing press and, and movable type where you could mass produce books. I mean before this books were hand copied by monks or other people. You didn't mass produce books. Now Copernicus could write, Copernicus was Polish, he could write his book and then he could publish his book and then Galileo could see his book and Galileo could learn from his book and then Galileo could write his stuff and then Newton could see that. They, they came with Copernicus and then Galileo and Kepler were kind of at the same time Galileo was bef born before Kepler and then died after Kepler, so he had a much longer life than Kepler. 
and then Newton came after them. Newton was actually born the same year Galileo died. So, and then when Newton, at the end of his life, I mean, he had all this stuff. I mean, they don't even scratch the surface of what he did. He's the one who came up with calculus, integral calculus, differential calculus. And, and at the end of his life, they asked him, you know, how did you see so far? And he said, because I stood on the shoulders of giants, meaning they, these two, Kepler and a few other people. So in other words, he was able to access what they had written, what they had discovered, not, not Einstein. Einstein's way after. I'm talking about these two here. What they had uh, done, along with Kepler, along with others, because this guy invented the printing press. Okay, so I just wanted to show you that to... to in, to get your enthusiasm up for what we're about to look at here. We, we're about to be look at three of the ten most influential people, three of the, yeah, three of the ten most influential people of the last 1,000 years. And so we were on Kepler, I mean Copernicus. Polish mathematician, okay, and then you can see there's a couple, and then again, if we were in class, I'd, I'd click on these links and we'd look at more stuff. We I can't do that on YouTube. Now, Tycho Brahe was someone else. Brilliant at observation, designed and built instruments that measured the position of the planets to far better accuracy than had been possible before. Amassed a large amount of data representing the positions of the planets for many, many dates. Did not possess the genius level of mathematical ability to use the data to formulate theories concerning the orbits of the planets. Hired Johannes Kepler as his assistant has a crater on the moon named after him, and in the old astronomy book, he's had a little picture, not much. He was, he was, he's gotten sh kind of short-shifted. So, but he was a very, very wealthy person, and he, was, and the king that he worked for loved him and gave him all sorts of money to build this huge observatory on the Earth. No telescopes. Telescopes had not been invented yet. So Tycho Brahe was able to make these very, very precise, precise measurements on the positions of the planets like nothing had been done before and he amassed this huge amount of data but what was he going to do with the data okay he, he just did not have the that that part that that part of the brain for him wasn't there okay it was there for a guy named Kepler and Kepler really 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 wanted to get what am I going to do here his hands on Brahe's um, records and there are all sorts of stories that Brahe finally gave his records his his, his observations his, his data to Kepler while Brahe was on his deathbed there are other stories that Brahe made was was trying to make sure that Kepler never got his hands on his data and Kepler went in there and swiped it unbeknownst to anybody they didn't know what happened to it Kepler got it well we're glad Kepler got his hands on it somehow we don't know how if you watch a video that I see there's a video there's a couple of videos down here one of these is really really good okay I don't know which one is which but one of these is really really good I would recommend watching them I showed them to the class when I did this class in the planetarium at Sac State so Danish astronomer it tells you when he was born when he died and all that good stuff died in, in Czechoslovakia it was, it was called Czech Czechia back then I guess okay then Johannes Kepler that was who Tycho hired he was just supposed to be a, a, an assistant, and I don't think Tycho had any any idea that Kepler in the history books would, would sur supplant him big time. Had strained relationship with Tycho. Tycho wanted to be the one to use his data to better explain the orbits of the planets. On his deathbed, Tycho begged, again, there's different stories about this. Tycho begged, according to the book that they had, Kepler to find a system that would make sense of his observations so that it may not appear that I lived in vain. Using Tycho's data, Kepler was able to formulate his three laws of planetary motion. Basically, people were trying to explain how did the solar system work. And of course, in the very beginning, we had the, the Earth at the center, and we had everything else orbiting the Earth, and that's where we got the retrograde motion and the loop-to-loops -loops and all that good stuff. Well, what Tycho wanted to say was that the Sun orbited the Earth, and everything else orbited the Sun. Okay, that was his thing, that the Earth was still stationary, but he thought it made sense to say that the Earth is stationary, the Sun orbits the Earth, but everything else we see doesn't orbit the Earth, it orbits the Sun, okay? So you got the Sun orbiting the Earth and everything else orbiting the Sun. That was what he wanted 
Kepler apparently to use his data to show. Well, Kepler showed the exact opposite, that the sun's the center of the universe and the earth is just another, well, the sun's the center of the solar system and the earth is just another planet orbiting the earth like Mars, like Venus, and all that. Okay, the only thing special about earth, I guess, is we can live on it. We can't really live anywhere else that we know of. Not nowhere else in our solar system, that's for sure, unless we're, we, we're heavily protected and have all sorts of high tech to allow us to survive. So German-born astronomer, mathematician, you can see that he lived from 1571 to 1630. So I think he died, what would that be, 30, uh, 59, he died at 59. Uh, I thought he died younger than that, but maybe I'm, I'm wrong. Anyway, he had a, a not a good life. Okay, and he was a teacher, and what he would do in the middle of his classes, he was trying to formulate how the solar system worked mathematically, and he would stop in the middle of his lectures and just start thinking, and students didn't know what was going on. He'd just be standing there thinking, and students would be staring at him like, what's this guy doing? And, um, and he, he, he lived during the time of this thing called the Thirty Year War, where the other European powers decided to fight their war on German soil. That's when Germany wasn't Germany yet. It was a bunch of separate principalities. You had Prussia, you had Bavaria. You had, they were all separate, and they were, they were they were not powerful at all. And so other countries fought their war on German soil. The Germans apparently weren't that involved in it, but it was being fought on their soil. And they had some some statistics say that like thirty percent of the thirty to fifty percent of the Germans were killed in this thing, and that he lived through that. So imagine having like you know we have CODIS going on. And stuff like that and people know people who died from it but this guy probably half the people maybe close to half the people he knew in his lifetime were killed in this war it'd be that's that's what it was like i mean as bad as we think we have it now it's, it's nowhere near what it used to be in this world i mean you go to some other bad countries in the world maybe it's close to what it used to be but uh not, nothing like it used to be uh we got it pretty good compared if you read history books we say we've got it pretty good compared to what those guys had to live through and Kepler had a, a rotten life. Okay, Kepler's first law of planetary motion. Again, we can't watch the YouTube video, but there it is for you to watch. The orbit of each planet about the sun is an ellipse with the sun at one focus. Kepler's second law of planetary motion. A planet moves faster in the part of its orbit nearer the sun and slower when farther from the sun, sweeping out equal areas in equal amounts of time. Okay, an imaginary line joining a planet and the sun will sweep out equal areas in equal amounts of time. Um, I should probably go through and this again and then make a little picture of that. Okay, but, but here here's the video to watch. Okay, we can't watch it here because I'm I'm already using I'm already using too much time here. Kepler's third law of planetary motion: more distant objects orbit the sun at a, at slower average speeds, obeying the precise mathematical relationship. The um, period squared, the time it takes a planet to orbit the sun, is equal to the distance the planet is from the sun cubed, basically. And it follows for all the planets. It's a very, very good approximation for all the planets. P is the planet's orbital period, and A is the planet's average distance from the sun. P is measured in Earth years, and A is measured in astronomical units. So, Kepler's laws of planetary motion, he published his first two laws in 1609 and his third in 1619. They allowed for far more accurate predictions of the positions of the planets. Look what he did here this first law. Remember that the uh, Greeks said everything had to be circular, heavenly perfection. Everything had to be circular. That's the, what they believed. They, they, they went by that. They were trying to explain how the heck the solar system worked by thinking, dude, these planets, because of the Greeks, what the Greeks said by intuition is that they had to be circular. Well, Kepler said, no, they don't. They're ellipses. Um, they're, 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 they're oval shaped kind of. And then you watch, so basically, that made for, for, and also Copernicus is putting the sun at the center of the solar system. That wasn't that accurate, to be honest with you. Because Copernicus still tried to say they were circular orbits. It wasn't until Kepler came along and said, no, wait a second, they're, they're ellipses, that people said, wait a second, now we can predict this thing way out, way better than we ever were before. Um, so beyond that, they allowed greater insight to the workings of the solar system. Kepler's laws of planetary motion is one of the most important pieces of information Newton used when formulating his three laws of motion. These laws provided more evidence of the sun-centered solar system, further supporting the Copernicus theory. 
Okay, continued objections to the sun-centered universe. If Earth is in motion, why are flying birds, falling rocks, and floating clouds not left behind as Earth journeyed on its way? Again, people did not understand that all that stuff is moving with the Earth, okay? It's like sitting in a car, going 70 miles per hour down the freeway. You're holding a ball in your hand. You throw the ball straight up. The ball doesn't go behind you. Say, hey, what happened to the ball? It comes right down into your hand. Why? Because the ball inherits that 70 miles per hour speed that you're going. As long as you're going at a constant speed down the freeway, you, you don't feel yourself much doing anything much different. If you had your eyes closed and earmuffs on, you may not even know you're in motion. Okay, the ball inherits that 70 miles per hour. The birds inherit the motion of the earth. Falling rocks inherit the motion of the earth. Floating clouds inherit the motion of the earth. That's why they are not left behind. Heavenly perfection was an idea that was difficult to discard. Non-circular orbits were considered imperfect, and accepting Kepler's first law was hard to swallow. Stellar parallax, which should, should be observed if Earth orbits the Sun, had not been observed. Again, we talked about that. It's because the stars were so, so, so far away that there was parallax, but it was so, so, so small that on Earth back in, in this time, they just did not have the equipment to detect it at all. We can now, but back then they could not. It was left to Galileo to provide answers to these head scratchers. And there's Galileo. Even got a song. Galileo, Galileo. Italian astronomer, physicist, and engineer was born in 1564 in Pisa, Italy. Died in 1642. So he had a nice, well, no, he didn't really have a nice long life. He had, he had a long life that was great up until he started insulting the Catholic Church. And then they showed him the torture, the tools, the, the instruments of torture. It said that he needed to say that the sun was, uh, the earth was the center, not the sun, because he he, he 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 believed in what Kepler and Copernicus were saying. And when he wrote about that and actually kind of made fun of the Catholic Church, that's when the Catholic Church got really, really, really angry. And it wasn't until recently. I'm not Catholic, so I don't know what the word is. They um, not pardoned him, or they did something. Like he was like uh, in the doghouse with the Catholic Church up until I think it was the Pope who was Pope when Reagan was president maybe the one the first Pope that wasn't Italian the Polish Pope maybe some of you who are Catholic know who I'm talking about uh, he was the one that they tr that, that someone tried to assassinate so then now now they got the Pope mobile to keep him from getting shot when he's out in among crowds um, that guy I think was the one who rehabilitated maybe it's rehabilitated Galileo all these years later like 500 years later or so so anyway, uh, he spent the last part of his life in um, house arrest. He also went blind, okay? Why did he go blind? Well, one of the things he discovered were sunspots on the sun. And that means he's probably looking at the sun with no filter or anything on it like that. So he probably damaged his eyes. So Galileo, who used his eyes to make observations at the end of his life, went blind. Beethoven uh, wrote great music masterpiece music and then at the end of his life he went deaf so kind of kind of is ironic a little bit so Galileo considered the father of modern science did not invent the telescope but improved the design greatly okay the story is this that one of the things that merchants wanted to know is when was merchandise coming in They'd have their big stores, and the, the sooner they knew their merchandise was coming in, the better they could prepare for it. So they had something, they had bananas coming in. No, they got bananas coming in from someplace. We got to clear out this merchandise to make room for the, plant, the bananas. The sooner they knew the bananas were coming in, the sooner they could start advertising, and the sooner, and so how did they find that out? Well, they would know what ship the bananas were coming in, and all the ships would have different masts, so they'd have different designs on their masts. So people would, they'd, have, they'd hire people to stand out on a hill, watch the ships coming in, and then when they saw the ship that was supposed to have the merchandise on it, they'd run into town and tell the merchant, oh, the ship's coming in, the ship's coming in. Well, the sooner you can get that information, the better. So when the telescope was first invented, that was one of its uses. Um, if you heard of Telegraph Hill in San Francisco, apparently someone would sit up there on the hill with a telegraph and would then see a ship coming in with a telescope and would deek, 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 and then would send the signal down into San Francisco saying, oh, this ship's coming in, this ship's coming in. Uh, who's ever got stuff on it, it's coming in now. It's not like Amazon where you can check your orders and see your, your shipments, your, 
the, 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 you get a little note saying, oh, your shipment just got delivered to your door. You can walk out to your door. There it is right there. It's, it wasn't like that, okay? So back then, they didn't even have telegraphs back in Galileo's day. So someone had to look through a telescope, see that the ship was coming in, run down into the town, and alert the, sh the shop owners, hey, look, your, your shipment's coming in now. You better prepare, okay? Now, Galileo heard about this telescope. He didn't invent it. Somebody, I, I think, uh, uh, someone, someone Dutch invented it, I believe. But um, he heard about it. So he got a hold of one. He improved it significantly. He made a way better telescope. And, of course, Galileo was thinking, hey, I want to make some money off of this thing. I got a better one. So who do you go to when you want to make money? You go to the military. The military would say, wait a second, with this telescope, we can see the, the enemy before they can see us. And so that's a huge advantage. Another thing is, as soon as nightfall came, all the telescopes got put away because, well, you couldn't see anything. Well, you couldn't see anything on the surface of the Earth, but Galileo then pointed the telescope at the sky. That was different, okay? No one else was doing that, apparently, or not very many people were doing that. At least nobody, if you had a telescope, you weren't doing it. Not many people who wanted to look at the sky also had a telescope. And he not only had a telescope, he had probably, at that point, the best telescope on the face of the Earth. He discovered that the moon was not as smooth and pearl-like, but, in fact, its surface was peppered with craters and mountains. He discovered that Venus went through phases just like the moon, another argument that we're all orbiting the sun in our solar system. The nature of these phases could only be explained by Venus orbiting the sun and not the Earth. Discovered moons orbiting Jupiter. That was huge. Now he could point at something, objects in our solar system that were not orbiting the Earth. These things are orbiting Jupiter, okay? These are now referred to as the Galilean moons and sunspots on the sun, which means he was looking at the sun through his telescope. Oh, man. And that's why he went blind at the end of his life. Perhaps viewed Uranus through his telescope. Okay, he's got notes in his book. So the way it works is if, it, if it's moving with the background stars, it's not in our solar system because... The only reason those stars appear to be moving, they're so far away, it's just the rotation of the Earth, it's the, the Earth spinning on its axis that makes the stars look like they move, so that's why it's so easy to say the stars were orbiting around the Earth. Okay, but if you saw something that was not moving with the stars, it had independent motion from the stars, there had to be some other type of motion associated with it, not just the spinning of the Earth, but also maybe it was orbiting around the sun as well, so it would have been in our solar system, or as they thought, orbiting around the Earth, maybe. So he wrote down some notes where it looked like he may have discovered Uranus through his telescope, but he didn't follow through. He didn't follow through. He found something that was moving relative to the background stars. It could have been a comet, for all we know. Okay, we don't know what it was, but uh, he didn't follow through. Otherwise, he would have been credited with discovering Uranus through the telescope. There is one similar to the one Galileo built that was an improvement over the other ones. Galileo discovered the, that the moon is not a perfect sphere. They thought it was pearl-like. It was like a pearl. And through his telescope, he could see all these craters and stuff going on there. It wasn't a perfect, smooth, like pearl-like uh, moon. Galileo's phases, that, that, that see Venus goes through phases just like the moon. You got full moon, you got new moon. Well, Venus goes through something similar. Venus is so bright, you really can't see that with the naked eye, but you can see it through a telescope. The Galilean moons, there's Jupiter, there's the moons orbiting Jupiter, here's the four big ones. There's a lot more moons orbiting Jupiter, but these guys are huge. These guys are close to the size of Earth's moon. That's how big they are. I think some are even bigger than Earth's moon. Sunspots, this is when, when Galileo was looking at the sun through the telescope. Oh, my... And so he, was, he discovered these little spots. So the, the, the sun was not perfection. Remember, heavenly perfection, heavenly perfection. But Galileo's finding all sorts of odd things that, that aren't quite considered perfection all over the place. Now, if the earth is in motion, why are birds not left behind? The legend is that Galileo dropped two different masses from the Leaning Tower of Pisa. The two masses were dropped at the same time and hit the ground at the same time. This completely contradicted Aristelian view that acceleration should increase with increasing mass. Historians believe that this experiment never actually took place. But we do know in his lab he would have long planks of wood and he'd roll, roll balls down the planks. And that's basically how he came up with all his laws of motion and was able to show that what the Greeks said about the two falling masses was not true. So yeah, here he is. Instead, Galileo observed balls rolling down inclined planes. 
since there were no stopwatches or even smartphones at the time, he used his pulse to time how long it took for the balls to roll down the inclined plane. Through these experiments, he was able to show that the acceleration of the balls had no dependency on their masses. Earth, if Earth is in motion, why are birds not left behind? Galileo also was able to show that anything on Earth's surface inherits the Earth's motion, including the at atmosphere and the birds. As a passenger riding in a car traveling at 65 miles per hour down the freeway, you toss a ball in the air, and the ball travels with you and falls back into your hand. The ball inherited the 65 mile per hour horizontal velocity from the car, just like everything on the surface of the Earth inherits the Earth's spin and spins along with the Earth. Think about this. The Earth has a circumference of 24,901 miles. The Earth completes a complete 360 degree rotation every 24 hours. That means relative to the Sun, the surface of the Earth moves at a speed of 1,038 miles per hour. So right now, you are moving, as seen from the Sun, at 1,038 miles per hour. This means the surface velocity of the Earth is 0 0.29 miles per second. Okay, yet if you jump in the air and lose contact with the, the Earth for a full second, you don't land 0 0.29 miles from where you jump from, okay? You, you land right where you, you jumped. This is because, this is because you, there should be an is in there, because you inherited the Earth's surface velocity. Okay, here we got stellar parallax and the sun. So, stellar parallax of the sun had not been discovered. So the point was, if Earth orbits the sun, then different stars should be seen behind the sun at different times of the year. But that is without the understanding of how far away the stars really were. So here you got the Earth moving around the sun. You see the star over there. And then you see the star over here. When you go six, you go three months later, you should see the star, you know, you should see this move. Okay, but still our parallax of the sun had not been observed. If the stars were very far away as they are, the equipment they had at the time would not have been precise enough to measure this parallax. The angle they were looking for would be, have been just too small. Even Tycho Brahe's tools were not accurate enough. Okay, now we get into Sir Isaac Newton and so this is the guy that was number two on the list of the most influential people in history. English match, but you know what? I think I'm going to call it quits now. I, I don't. I've lost track of time of how long I've been doing this. So um, hold on a second. Let me check something. Uh, this does an hour and 45 minutes. Um, here, you you can watch this if you, you're tired of watching. You can stop at any time and restart. Let me continue on here. Okay, Sir Isaac Newton, English mathematician, physicist, astronomer, theologian, and author who is widely recognized as one of the most influential scientists of all time and a key figure in the scientific revolution. Again, remember he was number two on our list of the thousand most or the 100 most influential people of the last 1,000 years. Newton's laws of motion. First law, an object at rest or in motion with a constant velocity, constant speed in a straight line, will remain in that state unless acted upon by a net external force. The second law, net force equals mass times acceleration. Okay, so the forces are pushes and pulls, things that are acting on you, pulling you, pushing you, and so on. And then the third law, for every force there exists an equal and oppositely directed force. So just look at the, at the first law. Uh, and there, these are laws that people didn't even, they seem so simple now, but people really did not um, know this. This, this, this. this did not exist. This is not the way people viewed the world. So there was before Newton and after Newton. Before Newton, we were just kind of messing around, not knowing how to put things in any sort of simple, simple laws. And here Newton did it, and, after, and then afterwards you understood Newton's laws, you kind of understood how things move. So an object at rest or in motion with a constant velocity, constant speed and straight line, will remain in that state unless acted upon by a net external force. So, so, you know, you say, well, hey, I slide this racer across the tabletop and it comes to a stop. Well, that's because there's a net force acting on it, the force of friction. Imagine hitting a, a, sliding a hockey puck across ice. It just keeps going and going and going. Or if you air, play a air, air hockey, or, you know, on an air table, 
you hit the little puck and it just keeps going and going and going because of the lack of friction or you you roll a bowling ball down the lane the bowling ball keeps going and going and going okay um, so things want to keep doing what they're already doing they want to move in a straight line at a constant speed and it's going to take some sort of force to keep them from doing it so you're in your car you're driving along and then all of a sudden some idiot cuts you off and you got to slam on your brakes so you don't hit them what happens to your body it moves forward so if you were going 40 miles per hour say and suddenly you got to slam on your brakes and go from 40 down to 20 in you know a second your body goes forward okay then more extreme cases if you're going like 60 miles per hour and you hit a brick wall well you better hope you have your seatbelt on because your body wanted to keep going 60 miles per hour and it will keep going 60 miles per hour okay and then if you don't have your seatbelt on, you better hope your airbags are working because your body wants to keep going 60 miles per hour. Your car has come to a stop. The car went from zero to, from 60 to zero in like 0.7 seconds, well, the, however long it took the front of your car to crumple up. And then if you don't have your airbags, you don't have your seatbelt on, then it's the windshield that's going to stop you, okay? Because you're going to go forward at 60 miles per hour. Now, on the other hand, let's say you're at a stop and you suddenly floor it well what does your body do then it goes back why you were at rest your body wanted to stay at rest you floored it and your body wanted to stay right there and so it's going to take the 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 force of the seat so normally if it's just a slow little acceleration like most people do then it's it's not it, the, the the friction between the seat and your rear end will allow you to accelerate with the car if it's a bigger acceleration you lean back against the back of your seat and the seat applies the force that accelerates you forward with the rest of the car. Okay, so it turns out that force, the net force acting on the object is equal to the mass times the acceleration that the object undergoes. Acceleration is the rate of change of velocity, okay? If the velocity does not change, there is no force. In order to have a changing velocity, an acceleration, then we would need a net force. The third law basically says that every force there exists an equal and absolutely directed force. So in other words, you push on somebody, they may have their hands still at, the, at their side, you go up and push on them, well you apply a force to them, but they apply an equal and opposite force back on you, even though they weren't pushing on you. So it's just, if you push against the wall, the wall pushes back on you, okay? It's, it's basically, for every force, there's an equal and opposite force. The earth pulls down on an apple, the apple pulls back up on the earth. Okay, so these are just things that people didn't think of before. So, Newton's first law. Things are lazy, they want to keep doing what they are already doing. If they are at rest, they want to stay at rest. If they are in motion with a constant velocity, they want to stay in motion with a constant velocity. In order to change what they are doing, a net force has to be applied to them. Okay, if a bowling ball and a basketball are at rest, you know it is easier to get the, bowling ball, the basketball in motion. If a bowling ball and a basketball are rolling at you at the, at the same constant velocity, you know that it's easier to stop the basketball than the bowling ball. The bowling ball has more mass and therefore has more inertia than the basketball. If you push an object and then it moves for a bit and comes to a, the rest, the Greeks believed it came to a rest because you stopped pushing it. Newton says that the object wanted to remain in motion with a constant velocity, but it slowed down and came to a stop because another net force must have acted on it. In many cases, this force would be friction. Think of a hockey puck going along the ice, continuing in motion due to inertia. Again, if we were in class, we'd be watching these videos, but we're not in class, so um, I'd recommend you watch them. Newton's second law, force e is equal to the mass of an object times the acceleration it undergoes. Force can be thought of as a push or a pull. The greater the push or pull, the greater the force is. Mass is a property of the object. It depends on how much stuff is packed into its volume. A bowling ball, for example, would have way more mass packed into its volume than a, basket, than a basketball would. The greater the mass of the object, the greater its inertia. The more inertia an object has, the greater its ability to oppose attempts to change its motion. You're trying to change the motion of the bowling ball by kicking it, that's not going to work out too well. But the basketball, you kick that, it just flies off. Acceleration is how fast you are getting fast or how fast you are getting slow. So even deceleration, what we think of as deceleration, slowing down in physics, a change in velocity over change in time, that is an acceleration. So even something slowing down is an acceleration in physics. 
For example, the acceleration due to gravity at the surface of the Earth is 9.8 meters per second squared, which is close enough to 10 meters per second squared. So in other words, if you drop a ball from a building after one second, it would be going about 10 meters per second. After two seconds, it would be going 20 meters per second, and so on. After three seconds, it would be going 30 meters per second. So its velocity would be increasing by 10 meters per second every second that goes by. Newton's third law, if you apply a force on, on someone, you will feel it at equal and oppositely directed force back on you. In Newton's first and second laws, we were only interested in the forces acting on one object. With Newton's third law, we are looking at two equal but oppositely, oppositely directed forces uh, acting on two different objects. The Earth pulls down on the apple, the apple pulls back up on the moon, on the, on the Earth. So here's the Earth pulling down on the apple. These should be equal length, by the way. They kind of look like that. Force on apple due to Earth. There's an equal and opposite force on the Earth due to the apple. When we see the apple fall down to the Earth, we don't see the Earth fall up to the apple. Why is that? Well, because look at the mass of the Earth. It's huge. And Newton's second law basically says acceleration equals force over mass. The forces are the same, but the Earth's mass is so huge that that acceleration we would see from the Earth is, like, negligible. And plus, it's got another apple over here pulling on it, too, probably. What you should know about Newton's laws of motions, sample, multiple choice questions. Okay. All right, okay, yeah, this is the kind of multiple choice question you would get. Um, uh, what I would do is ask either, which of the following is Newton given credit for? The discovery that the orbits of the planets are elliptical? That's Kepler. First place in the sun at the center of the solar system? That's Copernicus. Stating that objects want to keep doing what they're already doing? Yes, that's Newton's first law. Discovery of moons orbiting? Ju no, that's Galileo. So, <clears throat> and I could also have up here the top, which of the following is Galileo given credit for? And then it would be the discovery of moons orbiting Jupiter. I can say, what's Kepler? So, in other words, you don't, if you don't understand Newton's laws of motion, I don't expect you to. We would, we would have to spend way more time for you to understand and me to ask questions about it. But what you need to know is, what did Copernicus do? What did Kepler do? What did Galileo do? What did Newton do? So another way I could put this is, who is given credit for first placing the sun at the center of the solar system? And the four answers could be, uh, Kepler, Copernicus, ne uh, Newton, and Galileo. So those would be the kind of questions you will get on Tuesday uh, for these guys. Final thoughts on Newton's laws of motion. Kepler's laws of planetary motion describe how the solar system works, but not why it works like that. In other words, he were, these were observations. They're, the Greeks loved to make observations and use intuition, but not experimentation. But Kepler's were observations, not really explanations. It didn't say why the, the planet orbits were elliptical. It didn't say why uh, a, a line between the sun and the, and the planet would, equal, would, would sweep out equal amounts of area at equal amounts of time. It didn't say why the distance the planet is from the sun cubed is equal to the period of its orbit squared. It, it didn't tell you that. But we can go back with Newton's laws and figure all that stuff out. That's the point. The application of Newton's laws allows us to explain mathematically why the solar system, as well as the universe, acts as it does. So now, all of a sudden, we were able to predict stuff. Newton's laws worked to perfection until we started studying extremely small objects, such as electrons and, and, and the nucleus, and when we started to look at objects traveling near the speed of light. So not even until 100 years ago, when we started look, thinking about these things, even a little bit earlier than 100 years ago, did Newton's laws start to fall apart. So in other words, for our everyday life, Newton's laws are great. Okay, it's just when we, we go to those very unlikely situations where we're studying something that's close to the size of an atom, or where we've got objects moving close to the speed of light, do we have to, well, for, for the atom stuff, we have to turn to quantum mechanics, and for things traveling near the speed of light, we have to turn to Einstein's theory of relativity, Einstein's stuff. Well, this might be it. Nope, not. Final thoughts. Okay. So Newton also gave us the universal law of gravitation. He gave us both differential and integral calculus. He made many discoveries in optics and improved the design of telescopes. Copernicus published his book in 1543. Less than 150 years later, Newton published Principia in 1687. This rapid accumulation of knowledge is nothing less than a revolution in science. So just in 150 years, we went from having very little knowledge observations and stuff to basically being able to predict where the moon would be 10,000 years in the future. 
I mean, that, that's just one example of all the things you could predict. Matter of fact, um, Halley's Comet, you may have heard of that. It's a comet that comes around about every 76 years, the last time it came around before you guys were born. But I was alive then, and it was uh, uh, it was not that impressive because it's losing it's losing its its mass as it, every time it goes near the Earth. Every time it goes near the Earth, it loses around the Sun. Every time it goes around the Sun, it loses mass. But it, it showed up um, during Edwin Halley's lifetime. Edwin Halley was able to use Newton's laws of motion observation, Newton's laws of motion, to predict that it would return in 76 years. 76 years later, it returned. Okay, so that was a huge, 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 um, um, huge, um, oh boy, he, I can't even think of the word I want, I'm getting tired, huge uh, proof, or, um, I don't know, okay, it, 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 it was something that really helped out, saying, wow, this Newton guy was right. Towards the end of his life, Newton was asked how he was able to accomplish so much in the limited time we all have on Earth. His reply is, I have seen further, it is, if, if I have seen further, it is by standing on the shoulders of giants. And of course, he was talking about mainly Galileo, Copernicus, Kepler, and a few others that, that we didn't get to go into. Okay, hallmark of science. How much longer is this? I think we're almost done. We're here. Okay, modern science seeks explanations for observed phenomena that rely solely on natural causes. Science progresses through the creation and testing of models of nature that explain the observations as simply as possible. A scientific model must make testable predictions about the natural phenomena that would force us to revise or abandon if the predictions do not agree with observations. Modern science seeks explanations for observed phenomena that rely solely on natural causes. Kepler sought to explain the very accurate measurements of the positions of the planets. Tycho's data was the observed phenomena that Kepler tried to make sense of, and of course he did. Science, science progresses through the creation and testing of models of nature that explain the observations as simply as possible. Several possible models for the clockwork of the solar system were created. The Ptolemy's Earth-centered solar system was with perfectly circular orbits, Copernicus's sun-centered solar system that hung on to the circular orbits, Tycho's model where the planets orbited the sun but the sun orbited the earth, Kepler's model based on the Copernican model but with the idea of the perfectly circular orbits discarded. Perhaps a model based on Ptolemy's model could be forced to work if a large number of smaller loops were introduced into the orbits, but this would be not be very, not be very simple. It would be too complex. So it's like simple solutions. A scientific model must make testable predictions about the natural phenomena that would force us to revise or abandon if the predictions do not agree with observations. The models of the solar system proposed by Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Tycho were tested and it was seen that they became more and more inaccurate in predicting the positions of the planets as more time passed. Kepler's final model proved to be the most accurate. We have abandoned many potential models before we ended up with our current one. So science went through all this evolution to try to explain how the solar system works and finally we've gotten to where we are today so now it's eight o'clock i'm going to say good night and i will talk to you later and i'll send out a blast email about all this so good night